Dear students, I welcome all of you to this dermatology question discussion of the recently concluded INICT November 2023 exams. So under this discussion, we are going to discuss the following topics. We have two questions from bullous disorders, two questions from appendages and disorders, one question from papillosquamous disorder, one from infections, one from skin and systems, and one overlap topic in the form of skin malignancy as one question. Let's begin with the first topic of bullous disorders. Let's take question number one. A patient presented with vesicles and oral lesions. Histopathological examination reveals suprabasal split. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Now, when we look at this question, let us look at the key terms here. The question is talking about vesicles and oral lesions. That means we are discussing a vesiculobullous disorder. So the question here is on a vesiculobullous disorder. Further, this question tells us that there is a suprabasal split. Now, when I say suprabasal split, this disorder has to be intraepidermal. So it's an intraepidermal blistering disorder. And out of the given options, dermatitis herpetiformis is a subepidermal disorder. Bullous pemphigoid is also a subepidermal blistering disorder. Linear IgA disease is also a subepidermal blistering disorder. That is why the correct answer to this question is. Pemphigus vulgaris. Now, what is Pemphigus vulgaris? Now, Pemphigus vulgaris is a chronic autoimmune bullous disease, and this disease is going to target desmosomes. When we're talking about desmosomes, we have two important antigens to remember. We have desmoglein number three, followed by desmoglein number one. So, this is the precise antigen which is present within the desmosomes in Pemphigus vulgaris. Now, as we know, desmosomes are proteins which connect the keratinocytes together. How does a patient of pemphigus present? So initially we are going to have flaccid blisters and these flaccid blisters are going to rupture leaving behind erosions and very important feature of these erosions is because of acantholysis, these erosions tend to extend and do not heal. So whenever the MCQ mentions students that there are erosions which tend to extend and do not heal, think about a condition called as pemphigus vulgaris. Why does this happen? This happens because of a process called Acantholysis. So, acantholysis is a process where desmosomes are getting targeted. So, desmosomal rupture because of an autoimmune process is what happens in pemphigus vulgaris. When we look at the histopathology, let us spot the layers of the skin in pemphigus vulgaris. So, this is the stratum corneum. This is stratum basale. And you can see just above the stratum basale, what do we see here is a split. This split is called as supra basal split. So all students should remember that supra basal split is seen in pemphigus vulgaris. Further, you can also get some rounded cells which are called as acantholytic cells. So you can also have acantholytic cells. What is very characteristic is this basal layer. So if you look at the stratum basal carefully, you can see some gaps between the basal layer and this has a characteristic appearance. This is called as row of tombstone appearance which is described in pemphigus vulgaris. This is because the stratum basale is intact. Moving on to the second question from bullous disorders. A patient with several skin lesions undergoes an investigation and an image of it is shown below. What is the likely test? So we have indirect immunofluorescence, direct immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry and fluorescent in situ hybridization. Now, the correct answer for this question is direct immunofluorescence. So let us learn something about immunofluorescence. Now, immunofluorescence is a technique wherein you visualize the antigen antibody complex under an ultraviolet microscope by using antibodies which are tagged to a fluorochrome. So the antigen antibody complex which is forming is being detected by using a fluorescein tagged antibody and this can be visualized only when you use a ultraviolet microscope. So two important techniques to remember here are number one, direct immunofluorescence. Now direct immunofluorescence is a single step procedure. And here, what are you looking at? You're looking at the in situ or the in vivo antibodies which are bound to the antigen. So this is what we're detecting. That means the sample here has to be the patient's skin. Now, very important to remember is to detect direct immunofluorescence, the biopsy has to be taken from the perilesional normal skin. So please remember students, we do not take the lesion for direct immunofluorescence. 
the reason is if you pick up the lesion many a times it might be negative as these antibodies may be consumed by the inflammatory process so that's why we have to remember that in autoimmune blistering disorder the site of biopsy is always the perilesional normal skin so this is something which we should remember integrin of fluorescence is a technique wherein you use two steps here and what are we looking for is circulating auto antibodies so i hope all of us understood the difference in direct immunofluorescence the sample is the patient's skin in indirect immunofluorescence it is the serum which is being used because we want to detect the circulating auto antibodies in the serum so how does this help us in direct immunofluorescence we get a titer and this titer will help us to correlate with disease severity you can get to know the prognosis of the disease and response to therapy that means you started a patient on treatment you expect the titers to reduce with successful treatment so this is the direct immunofluorescence image of pemphigus vulgaris so always as i teach you should know the three things what deposits where is the deposition and how is the deposition so in pemphigus vulgaris we have igg c3 the site is intra epidermal because we know pemphigus is a intra epidermal disorder and the deposition is intercellular it is going to be between the cells because desmosomes are located between the cells and this characteristic pattern which we can see the image this is referred to as fish net pattern so all these three keywords are important for our exam in contrast if you see in bullous pemphigoid again the three questions which antibody deposits here the answer is igg c3 where is the site now here we need to remember in bullous pemphigoid it is the hemi desmosomes which are targeted and please remember students hemi desmosomes are located within the basement membrane zone that is why this deposition is going to be along the basement membrane zone and if you can appreciate here the deposition is in the form of a line that is why this pattern is referred to as linear pattern so always remember this point and the word granular pattern is used in a disease called as dermatitis herpetiformis which however is a iga mediated disorder so dermatitis herpetiformis the pattern is going to be granular in bullous pemphigoid it is linear in dermatitis herpetiformis it is iga which is going to be deposited in contrast with igg which is going to be there in bullous pemphigoid next we move on to two questions from appendices and disorders first question which of the following are causes of non scarring alopecia so the question is asking about non scarring alopecia which is rather reversible alopecia number 1 alopecia areata yes it's an example for non scarring alopecia telogen effluvium yes this is also non scarring alopecia androgenetic alopecia this is also non scarring alopecia frontal fibrosing alopecia now students try to follow this word fibrosing means scarring so the word itself is telling you that there is a word called scar there so four cannot be the option that means 1 2 3 all are causes of non scarring alopecia correct answer for this question is option number a 1 2 3 now if you look at alopecia areata it is a autoimmune disorder which targets the anagen hair bulb so this is going to target the anagen hair bulb and how does the patient present it you can see a circular area of complete hair loss is a very characteristic finding of alopecia areata the treatment of this condition is going to be intralesional triamcinolone so we give corticosteroids here. the best way of administering corticosteroids here is intralesional triamcinolone this condition is telogen effluvium again non scarring alopecia the concept behind telogen effluvium is severe systemic stress so all of you should remember this concept of severe systemic stress the examples in the exam are usually malaria it could be covid 19 or typhoid so some important examples of severe systemic stress so what happens is secondary to the systemic stress there is premature entry of hair into the telogen phase and please remember the telogen phase lasts for 3 to 4 months and that is why 3 to 4 months later the patient presents with hair loss patient presents with hair loss then we have androgenetic alopecia it happens because of the androgen factors and genetic factors so the main pattern baldness we look for frontotemporal recession and balding of the vertex in women androgenetic alopecia in women very important is that the frontal hairline is maintained frontal hairline is maintained so this is one key point we need to remember to differentiate between male and female pattern baldness 
Now, frontal fibrosing alopecia is a variant of lichen planus of the hair. It's a variant of lichen planus of the hair. So, this is usually seen in postmenopausal women. Usually seen in postmenopausal women. Two important points to remember. Number one, you can see this band like area of scarring alopecia. This is number one. Number two is this condition can also be associated with madarosis. So, two important things. Number one, band like area of scarring alopecia. Number two is the presence of madarosis. So, this produces scarring alopecia. Next question. Apocrine glands are found in which of the following areas? Option A, scalp. Option B, axilla. Option C, palms and sores. Option D, face. Now, apocrine glands are called so because their method of secretion is called as apocrine. So, what is the meaning of the word epo? Is something we need to understand. Epo means apex of the cell is pinched off. And apocrine glands are the body odor producing glands. So, the correct answer for this question is axilla. And they are responsible for body odor. Let's now take up the question from infections. A HIV patient presented with a white corrugated plaque on the tongue which could not be rubbed off. What is the most likely diagnosis? Option A, Candida albicans. Option B, HSV. Option C, HHV8. Option D, Epstein-Barr virus. Now, Candida albicans produces oral thrush. And this can be rubbed off. HHV8 produces Kaposi sarcoma and this is a tumor of the endothelium. So this presents as purplish nodules and plaques. In the context of HIV, if the patient presents with a white corrugated plaque, so the meaning of the word corrugated is thrown into folds or ridges and if this is cannot be rubbed off the correct answer for this question is oral hairy leukoplakia and the causative organism for oral hairy leukoplakia is option number d epstein bar virus so the correct answer for this question is option number d epstein bar virus so if this question comes in the exam hiv patient presenting with white plaques two important differential diagnosis number one is oral thrush now, oral thrush is made up of a layer of candida species and they are going to have debris and this can be rubbed off. Whereas the second important differential diagnosis is oral hairy leukoplakia, which is produced by Epstein-Barr virus. Now, in contrast to oral thrush, wherein the membrane is made up of fungal elements, here in oral hairy leukoplakia, that white plaque which you get here is because of hyperkeratosis. And what is hyperkeratosis? It is a structural change of the oral cavity. And unfortunately, because it's a structural change, it cannot be rubbed off. So this is the key feature to distinguish between oral thrush and oral hairy leukoplakia. So very simple to summarize once again, four important clues in the exam to diagnose oral hairy leukoplakia. So the question says HIV infected patient presents with a white corrugated plaque so we can see in this image very nicely you can see corrugation corrugation means thrown into ridges if it is located on the lateral border of the tongue and cannot be rubbed off our diagnosis is going to be oral hairy leukoplakia next we take up the topic on papillus membus disorder a young male presents with an itchy rash on the back as shown below what is the most likely skin lesion and the diagnosis so even with the lesions over here you can see multiple Papulosquamous lesions. So you see multiple papulosquamous lesions. And out of the papulosquamous disorder, this is one disorder which follows the lines of Langer. So you can see it's going to follow the lines of Langer. So a disease which follows the lines of Langer, this is called Christmas tree pattern. This is called Christmas tree pattern, which is seen in a disease called as pityriasis rosea. So with pityriasis rosea as one of the options, the characteristic answer of this question is going to be colorate of scale, which is seen in pityriasis rosea. Now, if you look at pityriasis rosea, apart from this, it follows the lines of Langer, which is called Christmas tree pattern. 
the characteristic scale here which we observe which looks like the collar of a neck all around the lesion so this scale is called as collarette of scales so this is another important point you should remember pityriasis rosea is an acute self-limiting eruption which is usually produced by hhv7 and the three important mcqs which usually come from rosea number one the first lesion of pityriasis rosea is called herald patch so this is point number one Point number two, the characteristic scale is called collarette of scale. And three is the Christmas tree pattern of distribution of the lesions. So these are three MCQs from Petrasis rosea. If you look at the remaining options, you have lichen planus is yet another papillus corpus disease on which you get the cam stride. And uh, Warren of Sering is the hypopigmented rim, which is seen around the lesions of psoriasis, which is seen in a plaque psoriasis generally treated with topical steroids. Next, we move on to the question on skin and systems. An overweight 12 year old girl has the following blackish discoloration on the neck. So when we look at this blackish discoloration on the neck, what is this? This is velvety plaque. You can see a hyperpigmented velvety plaque with a distribution on the nape of the neck. The correct answer for this question has to be acanthosis nigricans. The most common association of acanthosis nigricans is obesity. So its association is going to be with insulin resistance. If you were to look at the other options here, Cushing syndrome can be associated with your purple stripe. Zero derma pigmentosum is an autosomal recessive disorder where there is defective nucleotide excision repair, wherein it makes the skin more prone for malignancies. Cafe ole macules can be seen in uh, McCune Albrecht syndrome. However, always remember that in McCune Albrecht syndrome, we get a segmental. Cafe ole macule. You also get precautious puberty. And from the orthopedician's point of view, you get polyostotic type of fibrous dysplasia. So these are the three components which are there for McCune Albright syndrome, segmental cafe ole macules, precautious puberty, and polyostotic type of fibrous dysplasia. So acanthosis negligence can happen due to different reasons. It could be obesity. I told you which is the most common cause of acanthosis negligence. Drugs are there like nicotinic acid. So one of the drug which can produce acanthosis negligence is nicotinic acid. Endocrinal causes like polycystic ovarian syndrome. And you can also have malignancies like GI adenocarcinoma. Now, what exactly happens in obesity is in obesity, there is increased circulating insulin and this insulin is going to stimulate insulin like growth factor to activate it. And this is going to activate and stimulate the keratinocytes as well as the dermal fibroblasts. So keratinocytes and dermal fibroblasts start proliferating. That is why the skin has become thickened and it's velvety in texture. Let us take up the question on skin malignancy. A middle-aged Indian man has come to your OPD with a lesion as shown below. What is the most likely diagnosis? Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, lupus vulgaris, or a nevus. Now, what we need to remember about lupus vulgaris is generally the exam they mention central scarring. So, if you have an annular infiltrated plug with central scarring, think about lupus vulgaris. Many a times they may mention diascopy. You take the glass head and press the lesion. You can get apple jelly nodules in lupus vulgaris. If you look at this ulcer, what do we see? You see the margin of this ulcer, the edge of the ulcer, which is rolled out. Edge. The ulcer is seen on the face. The correct answer for this question is basal cell carcinoma. Now, basal cell carcinoma is one of the most common skin malignancies which are there. Two important properties to remember are BCC is a locally invasive. It's a locally invasive tumor and metastasis is a rare metastasis is rare and please remember this ulcer is also referred to as a rodent ulcer this ulcer is also referred to as a rodent ulcer which is very commonly seen over the face now let us take up some points which are from overlap from other subjects description of the clue cell was asked in the exam so we know clue cells are seen in bacterial vaginosis how you describe them they're basically squamous epithelial cell which are covered by bacteria resulting in a stippled border so the bacteria are going to cover the surface of the vaginal epithelial cell and this border is called as a stippled border then another question which was asked was 
or association of the organism producing slap cheek appearance. Now, slap cheek appearance is seen in a disease called as fifth disease, also known as erythema infectiosum. And the organism here is parvovirus B19, which is a DNA virus. So this parvovirus B19 is a DNA virus. It produces fifth disease, also known as erythema infectiosum. The characteristic rash is called slap cheek appearance. And it is also associated with pure red cell ablation. So this was the question in the INICT exam. So with this, we conclude the discussion of the dermatology questions. Wishing all of you all the very best for the upcoming INICT as well as NEET PG exam. Thank you.